Bellator Nation. Follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Championship. The dream catcher, Gegard Mousasi, has cemented his storied legacy. Now, the legendary reigning middleweight champ defends his title in a five-round MMA battle. Mousasi, round and pound! When he faces suffocating submission specialist, John Salter, who's won eight of his last nine bouts in the Bellator arena. Came for blood. Bellator MMA, live tonight on Showtime, where warriors rule. to Bellator 264. Uh, two weeks ago, we came off one of the biggest nights in Bellator history, the finals of the Featherweight World Grand Prix, where we crowned a new champion in AJ McKee. Well, we packed up our production trucks and we headed back east to return back to the Mohegan Sun Arena for another world title fight. Now tonight, six-time world champ and MMA royalty, Gegard Mousasi will put his middleweight title on the line when he takes on the number one contender in John Salter. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome in. I am Jen Brown, and joining me at the fight desk tonight, a guy who really needs no introduction. Everybody knows who you are, but Josh Thompson, former two-time world champ, but a new face, Austin Vanderford, our number two ranked middleweight. He's also undefeated. Excited to have you joining us tonight. I'm pumped to be here. It's going to be great. Okay, first, before we get to the fights, we got to ask. You notice you have a little brace there on your arm. Are you okay? What's yeah, going on? Yeah, a small little training injury, but a couple weeks, and it's off, and I'm ready to rock. Love it. Well, I know tonight you're going to have your eyes on our main event. He will be facing the winner of tonight's middleweight championship fight. So how do you think these two guys match up tonight? Man, I think uh, John honestly possesses the skill set to beat Gegard, but I think it's going to be a little tougher tonight. Gegard is, is such a, uh, he's got a wide array of skills and it's going to be a tough one for John. Um, Josh, I know uh, we've we've talked about these guys extensively. Jo John Salter told us, I've been preparing for this fight for five years. What do you think? Do you agree with his assessment that this is uh, Masasi's fight to lose? No, I, I don't, yes, I do agree. It is Masasi's fight to lose. But we have seen Masasi take some guys for granted. He does kind of settle in on the bottom sometimes and just concede that position. Well, I don't think he's going to do that tonight. After interviewing him for our podcast on Weighing In, he talks a lot about how he's motivated for this fight. He wants to prove to everybody that his loss to Lovato uh, Jr., when he had fought him, he settled in on the bottom, and he didn't take him until the third round to warm up, and he finally got on track, and he almost was able to get him out of there. So, look, I'm looking for a lot of great things out of Gegard tonight. Well, he said uh, we are going to have an exciting fight tonight. That's one thing he guaranteed to us inside uh, our fighter meetings this week. All right, well, for more on our main event, let's bring in the rest of our announced team tonight, Big John McCarthy and Mauro Ronaldo. Mo, we're in a good for a good one tonight. What do you think? Uh, yes, we are, Jen. Thank you very much. And, John, it's hard to believe that uh, 15 years ago I was in Japan calling Pride Fighting Championships, met a then 20-year-old Gegard Musasi who debuted in a one of the renowned Pride Grand Prix. It was his 15th professional fight. One of his two victories in Pride was against a guy who would become the inaugural Bellator middleweight champion, Hector Lombard. But... I still can't believe that both of us are still here, and not only still here for Gegard Mousasi, but about to make the first defense of his second reign as a 185-pound kingpin at Bellator. His longevity is incredible. His longevity is amazing when you're taking a look at the sport of MMA and what it takes to participate in this sport, and then doing it for almost 20 years, and doing it at the highest level, always competing against the very best there is out there. That's what makes Gegard so amazing. Take a look at the takedown here. This was a championship fight when he first won the Bellator Middleweight Championship. That was him against Rafael Cavallo, and he just dominated the fight. Then quickly, his second time, the title was free. Both Douglas Lima and Gegard going after it, but Gegard was the one that was able to control the fight, able to put Douglas down, use good ground and pound. He has got the complete game, and that's what makes him 
very dangerous. His stand-up is great. His ground is amazing. The reason the Bellator middleweight title was vacated was because Rafael Lovato Jr. had health issues, was forced to relinquish the title. Lovato, the only man to beat both Gegard Mousasi and the number one contender, the challenger tonight, John Salter. And Salter comes in a proven finisher. He's reeled off three consecutive wins. We know him as a slick submission artist, but the fight starts in the stand-up. It does start on the feet, but John Salter is one guy. When you're talking about a guy that's been able to melt his wrestling into a different form of getting people down to the ground and then using the jujitsu that he has established basically as a style of his own, because he does things differently, he's a guy that, you know, every fight he goes into, there's a finish. There's only been one time out of all the fights he's ever been in, only one time has it ever gone to a judge's decision. So John, is a finisher. He's a guy that goes in there and he does not try to control. He tries to get you out of the fight so he stays safe and he's very good at it. Intriguing matchup for the main event. The Bellator middleweight championship will be on the line when Gegard Mousasi defends against the number one contender, John Salter. Four fights complement the feature attraction. Two of the hardest hitting welterweights on the planet collide as former Bellator champion Andre Koroskov takes on the number 10 ranked Sabah Homasi. Number three ranked Bantamweight Magomed Magomedov squares off with number four ranked Rafian Stotts in about holding major title implications. We'll also see undefeated heavyweights. Number seven ranked Davion Franklin and Everett Cummings collide. And we will begin the night on Showtime at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, with a middleweight matchup between KO Machine Ty Gwerner and the Bellator debuting Haji Bestayev. And we kick off the first of our three prelims here at Mohegan Sun Arena. It's a contract weight of 195 pounds between Orlando Mendoza and John McNeil both fighting as professionals for the very first time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome to the cage John McNeil. Nashua, New Hampshire's John McNeil making his walk to the Bellator MMA cage for the first time. And as we just said, for the first time as a professional fighter, he turns 31 on August 31. And you can file this pro debut under the better late than never department. He went three and two as an amateur with three finishes, two via form of knockout, one submission. And he's been training for a long time, despite this being his professional debut. Well, he has been training for a long time. He's been training out at Joe Lozon and other places. You know, sometimes things just don't work out the way you expect them to, and you end up having to make choices. And you, that professional career that you wanted to start early just doesn't happen. But now's his chance. He's got a stage that he gets to go and show Scott Coker, the president of Bellator, this is what I'm made of. It's like an audition all the make. And he predicts he will either knock his opponent out or submit him. And now his opponent, Orlando, the syllable Fox Mendoza. The smile of a fighter making his very first walk as a professional mixed martial artist, Orlando Mendoza, taking it all in, fighting out of Bronx, New York, by way of Venezuela, wanting to plant that flag for Venezuelan mixed martial arts. He went 3-0 as an amateur with two knockout wins. And of course, John, he'll want to avoid the Mendoza line when it comes to his winning percentage. If you know, you know. You know. <laughs> you take a look and you know, again, this is a pro debut and, and there's so much as far as pressure on both these guys. Because this is a walk they've never made, Moro, as a professional, under big lights. Now, amateur shows a lot of times, there can be 10 people, 50 people, maybe 100, but not a lot. And it starts to now become real when you're stepping in that cage and you look around and you go, oh my God, what have I got myself into? Well, we're going to find out real quick. The bright lights of Bellator MMA await Orlando Mendoza and John McNeil 
as we look at the tail of the tape for our first fight of the night. Our tail of the tape for this contracted weight. You can take a look, pro debut. That says everything. Both these guys are gonna go out there and put it all on the line. With the official introductions, here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be back, and it's good to see you here tonight with us live in Mohegan Sun Arena. As we get set for the Bellator 264 prelims, we'll welcome those joining us live, streaming tonight's fights on YouTube at Showtime Sports and Bellator MMA as we kick off the evening now with three five-minute rounds at a contract weight of 195 pounds. Introducing first the blue corner at six foot three, weighing in 195 pounds, even making his professional debut. He fights out of Nashua, New Hampshire, presenting John McNeil. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 194 pounds tonight. He too makes his professional debut by way of Venezuela. He fights out of Bronx, New York, Orlando, the Silver Fox, Mendoza. And the referee in charge, Todd Anderson. Both athletes receiving a nice round of applause, both with their supporters in attendance here, the early arrivers at the Mohegan Sun Arena. John McNeil wants to celebrate his 31st Backup. birthday early. Ready? Orlando Ready? Mendoza Ready? hoping to strike first, strike last, and strike most effectively. And instead, it's McNeil that opens the fight up with a striking attack, taking Mendoza down. Nice job of using pressure going forward. Force Mendoza back. He's in a bad position already. That arm triangle is almost set in. He's just trying to get his leg free. If he can get that leg free and come to the side, he's going to be able to put a lot of pressure on that choke. McNeil is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt, putting the squeeze on Mendoza early. Even from the mouth position, there's a lot of pressure here. Now he's able to get his arm free, so he's free from the choke, but now he's in mouth. If you're in your pro debut and you're John McNeil, it doesn't get any better at the start of your career than this. And if you're Orlando Mendoza, conversely, it doesn't get any worse. <laughs> That's exactly it. And Mendoza looking to reverse but McNeil staying strong in top position, drops an elbow. Mendoza desperately trying to neutralize the offense as McNeil appears to be setting up another arm triangle attempt. He's searching for that arm triangle, but you gotta make sure that you get it set right before he decides to make that move to the side. Mendoza being able to oop his way out, changing that balance point to McNeil having to let go. Ground and pound from John McNeil as Mendoza trying to buck him up, trying to create a reversal instead he gives up his back. So from the arm triangle, McNeil may try to go for a rear naked choke. McNeil did a very nice job of getting his hips back down towards Mendoza's hips. That kept him in position because he was high. And he's got his full hooks in now, looking to extend Mendoza's body. Under three minutes left in the first round, it's been all John McNeil following an early takedown. It has definitely been all John McNeil. He just needs to settle down, take his time, figure out how am I going to get these arms in the position that I need around that neck. And of course, with all of the jitters, the, the butterflies that come with making your pro debut, especially here under the bright lights of Bellator MMA, it's up to McNeil to display that patience, John, that composure, especially in a grounded position like this. Absolutely. When well, this is what I'm talking about, when, when you first walked in, I said, look, this is an audition. What you're trying to do is show that man across the cage from us, Scott Coker, hey, I can fight, and I am someone you want to sign. That's what this is all about. Mendoza doing a nice job, at least he's keeping that knee shield up inside. Looking for a look at the heel. Oh, the heel hook right now does not have it. So two hungry athletes, despite Mendoza being on the receiving end of ground and pound and being on his back the majority of the time, still fishing for a submission as well. He 
issue for Smith. John McNeil needs to be very careful about keeping his head past his hips. His hips should be before his head, so he does not get up kicked. Mendoza representing the Bronx Combat Club, while McNeil trains a team KTA MMA and Karasu Tengu Academy. A minute and a half remains in the opening round. He's got that arm triangle set again. Take a look at those strike stats right now. McNeil, 14 of 35, one of three for Mendoza. And that's because it's hard to punch someone when you're on your back. And the majority of those strikes help set up the takedown. Absolutely. Coming up on the final minute of the first frame, John McNeil continues to work from top position, drops some elbow strikes. Mendoza trying to defend, but unable to reverse his fortunes here. Under a minute left. He's doing a good job, but most of these are not landing cleanly on him, so it's a good job overall. By All it takes is one. Yeah, it does, and that one right there hurt. You can see where his hand came up to protect himself. Starting to turn his back again, and he's be careful about giving that back. 30 seconds left in the first round. Ground and pound from John McNeil. Mendoza needs to continue to move. Active hips will at least upset the balance of McNeil, just like you saw right there. His hips were active, and now McNeil working from Mendoza's back. Hammer fist to the side of his head, to the ear. 10 seconds left. John McNeil's first round as a professional mixed martial artist couldn't really have gone any better. Not at all. Hey. Nice and easy up, boys. Yeah. Beautiful. How you feel? Nice. That was, that's it. You see? That's it. That was a beautiful job. That was a beautiful job, yeah? Hey, sit up there, eh? Take you, hold the hands and go for your arm. That's good, that's beautiful. Here was the takedown right off the start. Throwing punches, throws the left, the right, come back with the left, and it just drops level. Not the most technically perfect as you're looking for, but definitely got the job done, and then the ground and pound started. And this is where Mendoza at least tried to intertwine the leg, went for a heel hook, it did not work for him. You see McNeil Second just up. landing big shots. Second and this up. right here, this is where McNeil needs to be careful. That face sticking up. He tries the up kick. It just misses the head, glances off him, and Good then work. big elbows from the top. Good work. Ready? Ready? Hey! The bell in round two, Orlando Mendoza in the red gloves. John McNeil in the blue gloves. It's part of my contract, so I have to ask the question, how did you have it on your unofficial scorecard, the opening round? That opening round is no doubt a 10-8 round for John McNeil, but what Mendoza needs to do now is say, okay, that round's gone. I survived it, so I'm happy with what I'm doing right now. Now let me get back to fighting my fight. Don't fight my opponents. If it is a stand-up game that he wants to fight, then keep this on the feet and start throwing punches and kicks to give McNeil a problem. The southpaw McNeil putting some pressure on now. Using a lazy left hand to set up the level change into another takedown. Yeah, McNeil right now, he's just bulldogging Mendoza. He's just bigger, stronger, and he's able to, when he wants to, he comes into him and is able to just physically control the body, bring him down. Mendoza trying to use a half guard. He needs to get that far side underhook. You see him with an overhook on the forearm. That is not going to help him. He's got to change that. Now going back towards going to a full guard. He gets McNeil into full guard. And McNeil trying to posture up while Mendoza hopes to neutralize his attack from bottom. McNeil has that. Left hand momentarily free, dropped a couple of shots before Mendoza now trying desperately to just neutralize the attack, but he has to find a way to escape this predicament. Well, you see him, he's got the overhook on the left side, and then he's trying to use that knee to control the left arm that McNeil's been using to try to drop hammers down on him. Here we go. Here we go. 
Mendoza's got to get in his mind. I cannot sit here and accept having my back on the canvas. If you're not throwing up submissions that can actually have effect and change this fight, you need to be thinking about getting yourself back to your feet. You know, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel from his back, but uh, he didn't have uh, John McNeil on top of him. No one was punching him in the face. <laughs> the Sistine Chapel would have looked a lot different if he was getting punched. McNeil's just... Boy, my, yeah, meanwhile, McNeil wants to turn in his own Michelangelo masterpiece in his professional debut, continues to control Mendoza, and yet he needs to also improve his position from top position and, and go back to what he had early success in that opening round going for the arm triangle submission, but working from the close guard of Mendoza. And what you say, I'm John, exactly what you saw in the first round, he was trying to improve that position. He was switching from half guard, getting into full mount. All those things were great positions that he was attaining. This right now, he's starting to accept the guard. Now he's landing punches now and then, but this eventually could mean that the referee could come in and stand them up based upon you're not improving to a better position. You know that Mendoza trying to telepathically send that message to the referee. <laughs> Our referee, Todd Anderson. 90 seconds! 90 seconds! Nice little chopping elbow, forearm strike by McNeil. What McNeil really needs to do, though, you see his head down on the sternum area of Mendoza. That is when you've got no real power. I think he's got to start to posture up and bring heavy shots down. That's what's going to make Mendoza have to move. Final 60 seconds of the second. Mendoza now opens the guard over hook over the right arm of the southpaw, McNeil. But McNeil unable to get much on track in terms of offense from top position. And when you're seeing Mendoza then close his guard again, he's the one that's actually holding on to McNeil, so he's not trying to get out of the position. He needs to open that guard, either go to a butterfly or go to something as far as an elevator or something to try to at least reverse the position or get his feet on the hips so he can get McNeil off. Thus far in Mendoza's professional debut, the elevator's only gone down. <laughs> It's okay, there's another round. One more round remains as we head into the home stretch. And McNeil wanting to become more offensively optimistic, but we're headed to the third and final round. That's easy, boys. Good work. Okay, give me this, listen. You need to, when he does, if he does take you down again, I want the overhook inside bicep frame scoot out to that same side. We can't let him have the two arms to hit, okay? Remember, overhook, inside bicep frame, crawl and climb your legs up. But let's just stop him from taking you down this time. That's all he wants, he's gonna throw, he's gonna rush forward, swing, and take down. That's all he does. We're gonna have to, if he don't come hook, you know how to go into the fight until he come in. And we've had a takedown again, we squared the hit. Let's go to the half guard if we have to, yes? right now I have this fight at 20 to 17 so that would say that Mendoza needs to finish John McNeil if he wants to get a win either that or have one incredible round that's 
the beauty of mixed martial arts. It's possible. It is possible, but with what he's doing, it's not going to be. Likely not. He needs to, you know, attack. In listening to his corner, his corner is the right left and a right hand. Sorry, John, as McNeil landed with a scoring combination. He did. His corner is telling him, you know, you can't get taken down. That's great. But you're not telling him what to do not to get taken down. And McNeil now beginning to pick apart Mendoza in the stand-up. Front kick. With the bread basket, the faint. And at least right there, you saw Mendoza at least take the steps back. He's circling out. That at least says he's thinking about what he's doing. That's going to keep McNeil from being on that linear attack coming straight in. And there's the level change, and yet another takedown for John McNeil. McNeil's corner was very, very good in their instruction. One of the things they said, don't stay in his guard. I want you to pass to at least a half guard because he's going to be much more dominant in that position. McNeil, three for three in the takedown department. Well, if you're McNeil and you uh, wrote the script for your first fight, you couldn't have written much better than what's That's happening. That's it, John. Beautiful word. Stand up. Stand up. Heavy hips down for John McNeil, getting on top. He's got the ability to do a lot of damage right here. He needs to not stop his attack. That's it, doing the side control. Under three minutes left here in the final round. McNeil now working from side control, trying to land those left hands. Mendoza trying desperately to just control posture, trying somehow to force a stand-up, but he is in dire straits here with McNeil in cross-side position. Well, especially with cross-side, you see that underhook, that right arm underhook under the left arm of Mendoza. That's right into keeping, mount. That's keeping McNeil, and that's how he got the mount. And now, midway point of the final round, McNeil dropping elbows from the top. Mendoza trying desperately to somehow get McNeil off his back. Mendoza's in a lot of trouble here. Now he's spent a lot of energy already, and he's been beat on for two rounds. It is not the same as far as getting yourself out of these positions. Coming up on the final two minutes of this fight, being contested at a contract weight of 195 pounds. And McNeil, start of the fight, looking for the arm triangle, trying to finish the fight with an arm triangle. He was searching for it again, but let go of it. He could feel that Mendoza was looking to bump and upset his balance points and decided, I'm just going to go back to bout. Let me start dropping hammers. Some days you're the hammer, some days you're the nail, and uh, with his professional debut, Orlando Mendoza spent a lot of it getting nailed, getting nailed to the canvas with the takedowns, and McNeil continuing to deliver offense, a slashing elbow across the face, John. Yeah, that one hurt right there, and you can see Mendoza react to it. He's taking a lot of abuse right here. Referee Todd Anderson's not going to let him take much more. It's referee Todd Anderson going to get John McNeil, a memorable 31st birthday gift. He does in his professional debut. John McNeil stops Orlando Mendoza in the final round. Happy 31st birthday on August 31st. What impressed you the most about the neophyte mixed martial no, artist? No. You know, I, I, I'm impressed by both, and I know that sounds strange, but what, you got to look and say John McNeil did everything that he was supposed to do. Got great positioning, used good, smart, you know, striking at the time when he's on the ground. Here's the big takedown. This was the one in the third round. Look at the head. He needs to drive forward a little more, gets him to the ground, and then move to a better position like his corner told him. And then at the end, you can see, look at Mendoza has no way of stopping the attack. Now he's just becoming a punching bag. Nothing coming back. He's just trying to hide. And that's why referee Todd Anderson stops the fight. Teaching moment for Orlando Mendoza. What would you like to see out of this fighter here? You know, Orlando Mendoza, the one thing you got to say is th this guy came in here, he is tough because it's hard to be the nail, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. It's easy to be the hammer. Yeah. It's tough to be the nail. And he never gave up. He just <laughs> systematically got beat to the point he couldn't protect himself anymore. So two fighters who have now, well, realized their 
goals of becoming professional mixed martial artists and for John McNeil a good first impression for Orlando Mendoza an opportunity to go back study the film make the necessary adjustments and come back hungrier than ever let's make it official now with Michael C. Williams Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, referee Todd Anderson steps in, waves off the contest due to unanswered strikes. Official time, three minutes, 57 seconds into round number three. The winner by TKO, John McNeil. Let's go to Big John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with John McNeil. John, if you were going to script the perfect pro debut, you couldn't have written a better script than what I just saw right there. <laughs> yeah, that would take it. <sighs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was uh, hoping to do, come out, use my jiu-jitsu. I need my strikes to stand with them, but at the end of the day, I want to use my submissions. I'm a jiu-jitsu guy, so that's what I did. You kept hunting for that arm triangle. In the first round, you went for it a couple of times. You actually almost went to it again in the third, and you decided, no, I'm not going to do it. Tell me what you were feeling and why you said it's not going to work. I was a little high. Each time I got on it, it was a little high. I know the feeling, the sweet spot right when you're on it, and I wasn't on it, so I went to something else. You've got a birthday coming up. You're going to be 31 years of age. Is this what you want to continue to do, fight MMA in the Bellator cage? I would love to continue to do this. A dream. I want to wish you a big congratulations on a pro victory in your first fight. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, John McNeil. Following an impressive professional mixed martial arts debut, you bet John McNeil can have his birthday cake and eat it too. Let's go to Jen Brown. He's going to be celebrating tonight. Well, thanks, Mauro. Hey, we've got a fantastic fight card coming up your way on Showtime at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. A title is on the line when six-time world champ Gegard Mousasi defends his middleweight belt against the division's top-ranked contender in John Salter. And in our co-main event, Andre Korshkov is making his long-awaited return to the Bellator cage. Now, the former welterweight champ will face dynamic knockout specialist Sabah Hamasi. And for more on how these two match up, let's head across the pond to Bellator's London office and check in with Gareth A. Davies. Andre Koreshkov faces Sabah Hamasi tonight in what promises to be an explosive contest between two of the hardest hitting welterweights in the world of mixed martial arts. Former Bellator champion Koreshkov, a nine year veteran of the fight organization, has notable victories over the likes of Douglas Lima and Benson Henderson, but has slid out of the rankings in recent times. Still just 30 years of age, though, the Russian has an all round armory and is always dangerous. Hamasi, meanwhile, brings heavy hands and puts it all on the line in every contest. He carries 10 of his 15 wins by knockout and will look to bounce back from a knockout loss himself to Britain's Paul Daly just four months ago. Victory for Koreshkov would likely mean a place back in the top tier, but it could be a case of who explodes or even who implodes first between the Spartan and the Punisher. Don't blink when the bell rings for this potential thriller at £170. Well, that's good advice right there. He said, don't blink, and that is so true when these two enter the cage tonight. So let's talk Karatana first. He's a former Russian, I'm um, sorry, Korshkov, thank you. Korshkov first. He's a former Russian uh, champion, right? And he's so dynamic. He's so explosive. He's known for those highlight reel knockouts. What makes him so dangerous, Josh? Well, you brought it up. His spinning attacks, his ability to, to land big shots, but all the things he does very well, he mixes it up. The one thing I can say about him being a former champion is he can mix it all up flying knees as you see against Benson Henderson also all the other things he does the spinning back kick the side kicks he has finishes in almost every facet of this sport with submission as well but I just want to be honest tonight well sure he's gonna have to use his stand-up and his flying attacks and his spinning attacks against Hamasi to get the win but it's not just that Austin it's gonna be his wrestling I think and you'd be better suited to talk about that yeah I would agree I think uh, using his spinning attacks and being unpredictable with the striking to set up his wrestling would be good for him. Well, let's talk uh, his opponent tonight, Hamasi. Josh, you said in order for him to win tonight, he needs to fight smarter. What do you want to see from him tonight? 
Austin, how can we see Homasi fight smart? Talk to me. You train with him. You know him. I do, and I, I pound in his head, man. Just just be smart with your striking. Touch him up. Use that calf kick, and and uh, I think he's got a good shot at putting putting uh, Andre away. Yeah, what he possesses, he possesses the power. We've seen it in a lot of his fights. Okay, boom. He's got the one crunch that so many people wish they had. I wish I had that when I was fighting for 20 years. I never had the, the power that some, like someone like him. He possesses not just the flying attacks, not just the power in his hands, but he is dynamic. He also will utilize his wrestling if it, that gets him to the win as well. We saw him use that against Curtis Millender as well. So I think he has a lot of things that he brings to the table to get this win over Korshkov. Uh, this is going to be an exciting one. Really looking forward to it. All right, well, that's our co-main event coming up later tonight on Showtime. But now let's go back down cage side for more fight action, Mo. All right, thank you very much, Jen. We get set for a fight. At a contract weight of 142 pounds, Jeffrey Glosner and Sebastian Ruiz both looking for their first victory in Bellator MMA. And now ready to make his way to the cage, Sebastian El Gallo Ruiz. Sebastian Ruiz would love to make a Bellator MMA his permanent home, but will have to snap a two-fight losing streak in order to garner consideration. In fact, lost his Bellator MMA debut to Mike Kimball, albeit via split decision, John. It was by split decision, and it showed that Sebastian Ruiz is very athletic, he's very fast, he's long, and he's good in the stand-up. The real question is in this fight, he's gonna wanna keep this on the feet while his opponent, Jeffrey Glosner, is gonna wanna use his wrestling ability to take it to the ground. Can Sebastian keep it where he wants it to be? Ruiz is two and three, both wins via form of a knockout. And again, his Bellator MMA debut took place at Bellator 222 in June of 2019. And he feels that coming into this fight, what will give him his greatest success are his kicks and his overall durability. Like I said, he does have very good stand-up. He has power, he's athletic, he knows that he's gonna have to keep this fight on the feet for him to be successful. And he predicts that this one will be a war. And now making his way, Jeffrey Glossner. Twenty-five-year-old Jeffrey Glossner fighting out of Crofton, Maryland, the Southpaw, who is two and two, and both of his victories have come by knockout. So, what are the odds that this turns into a grappling exhibition? Well, there's two knockout artists. <laughs> this definitely. If you're Jeffrey Glazer, you want it to turn into a grappling exhibition. You know, his first fight in uh, Bellator, he fought a guy that I think is part of the future of the sport, and a guy named Jalen Bates, who is just good everywhere. And Jeffrey Glosner is a guy whose his stand-up is good. His ground game is actually outstanding. And he knows that he has an advantage in that against Sebastian. Can he put the fight there? That's the question. Remind me to never ask you to put on a Japanese necktie. Too painful, <laughs> just as Glosner found out at the hands of Jalen Bates. Let's go to the 411 for this matchup here again at a contract weight of 142 pounds. Take a look at this. Two and three, look at the age, both young. They're young in the sport. The advantage of Ruiz with that 72 inch reach, we'll see if that actually works for him in the stand-up game. Here's Michael C. Williams. Those joining us tonight from the UK on BBC iPlayer. We thank you for staying up late with us here at Bellator 264 for the prelims. Where we go to fight number two, set for three five minute rounds at a contract weight of 142 pounds. And now first, introducing the blue corner. At five foot nine, weighing in 141 and three quarter pounds, his professional record two and three. Originally from Lima, Peru, he fights out of Newark, New Jersey, Sebastian El Gallo. Ruiz. 
And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 142 pounds. As a professional, he's two and two from Severn, Maryland, presenting Jeffrey Glossner. In charge, your referee, Mike Beltran. Veteran official Mike Beltran will oversee our second preliminary matchup here at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut. Sebastian Ruiz at 23, right, Jeffrey round. Glosner is 25, and we begin with Glosner in the red gloves, Ruiz in the blue gloves. Walking down Ruiz. Ruiz gets countered with a left hand. Nice job by Glosner. Ruiz doing a good job. He started moving to his right. He doesn't want to move into the power of Glosner. He's going to be better off if he's moving to his left like you see right now. Nice job by Glosner to cut that, that cage off. A lot of guys start to follow. He's not following. He's actually stepping in front and making him stop. And Ruiz attacking the lead leg and then going upstairs with a kick and showcasing some serious hand speed. Lights up Glosner with that right down the middle. He did, but Glosner did hit a beautiful left to the body. And he just hit him with a left knee. One minute has elapsed here in the opening round, scheduled for three five minute rounds. As Ruiz continues to move to his left, following the advice of the sage Big John McCarthy. And there's a kind of a left knee kick there by Glosner. Oh, wow! That was a big left hand landed. And it was more off balance by Glosner going down, but it was power to put Ruiz down. Straight left. Glosner putting it on Ruiz. Ruiz changing levels, giving up his neck as Glosner looks for the guillotine. He always know when the guy who is supposed to be the striker is now going for the takedown. Things are not going well for him. Nice guillotine. That is deep. He's got that locked in well. He can use his legs, control. Nice job, Ruiz, to pop his head out. Ruiz was submitted by a Dars choke in May of 2018 against Jesse Arnett. And from bottom now, Glosser looking for the armbar. Glosser did a beautiful job of getting his hips around there. Sticking with that armbar. You should know that it's not there. So Glosner looking for his first submission as a professional mixed martial artist. Now controlling Ruiz's posture momentarily. Not only controlling the posture, look at where he keeps the head of Ruiz. It's down, that makes it very difficult for Ruiz. I'm bringing up the triangle. Do a nice job of just switching his attack. He's got a high guard, it's not a triangle right now. It's not doing any kind of choke, but if he can, what he wants to do is grab that shin and start to lock that leg down, but he's got to break the posture of Ruiz. And Glosner delivering hammer strikes, hammer fists and elbows from the bottom, now the rubber guard. Very flexible. He's trying to lock that in. You see the angle that he's got, it's where that arm is across. He's going for the arm bar with it. Take a look at the arm being stretched. Glosner doing a good job. Nice job by Ruiz fighting through it. And see that in space. He does not have it tight right now, so Ruiz is not really in a tight choke. And Ruiz dropping hammer fists on Glosner's face. Tight. As Glosner putting the squeeze on Ruiz. He's going to lock it down and squeeze his knees together. That's going to be the difference. And put his hands on the head. Control and squeeze that together. He can also take his arms and wrap them by his leg and squeeze with his arms. That will intensify that choke. Under a minute remaining in the first round is Sebastian Ruiz going to survive it. You can see Ruiz is in trouble. That's why he's going to that position. He does not want to end up underneath Glosner. 
Right now, that cage is keeping him from going all the way over. But it's also keeping Glosner from being able to get the squeeze that he wants with his legs. And now Glosner again from his back on the triangle. And the hammer fist from Ruiz, desperately trying to stay alive in this fight. 15 seconds left in the first round. And Ruiz escapes. Nice job, Ruiz escaping. This way, you look, you look at Glosner. Don't just stop because it didn't work. Well, and Ruiz isn't stopping as he punches to the final bell in the opening round. Sebastian Ruiz feeling himself after escaping some uh, pretty tight Rapido, squeezes, Rapido. courtesy of Jeffrey Glosner. He can put his hands up, and that looks great. He can say, look at me, I'm still alive in here, and he is. But he definitely did not win that round. But a nice, nice, tough effort by Sebastian Ruiz to stay in this fight. Look, at here comes that. This was what started. Bink right there, you, but Glazer goes down off of that bump of the head. It wasn't that it hurt him, but he was off balance. Ruiz is the one that took the big shot. Here he goes when he sets up the arm bar, goes for the arm. You see he's got it in place. Ruiz is able to get that elbow pass, turns outside. He says, Second out. He's lost it at that point. Then he locks up the triangle, goes for the triangle, never gets it in place where it's really tight. Sebastian's able to work his way out. And Lance some ground and pound at the end. Yeah, Ruiz making the most of the uh, limited time he had in top position in that round. Second round. You ready to fight? You ready to fight? It'll be interesting to see the legs and what happened, the movement of Glosner based upon having that triangle and the squeeze. You never know exactly how hard he's squeezing with his legs. Ruiz just backed him up with a right hand and a right kick, and Ruiz pouncing on Glosner. Glosner though ends up again in top position out of the half guard of Ruiz. So a scary moment for Glosner early, but he turns it into an advantage. Actually, turns it into a very good advantage because. Sebastian overextended, yes. came in too far, and that's why he ended up in this position. Glasner is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu blue belt. He went to Edinburgh University in 2014, but was unable to wrestle due to his grades. Of course, in MMA, we've had fighters like Josh Koscheck and national champ Gregor Gillespie at Edinburgh University, who became pro mixed martial artist. Very, very outstanding school for wrestling. Take a look right now. We've got a choke that's taking place. Right now, he's trying for a dart, but he's not in position with it. Sebastian's not in a bad spot. And Glosser understood it. That's why he lets go. Tries to go to something that's going to work better for him. That nice little grab of the cage by Sebastian Ruiz. If you ain't cheating, you're not trying. Huh. All right, Jesse, the body felt true. <laughs> Ruiz with some short knee strikes to the leg of Glosner. Glosner pinned up along the fence. Minute and a half gone here in the second stanza. First round belonged to Jeffrey Glosner. Ruiz looking to get back into this scrap, attacking the lower extremities before Glosner goes for the takedown and secures it again. Nice body lock, takes him down. I think Glosner's gotten a little bit of his second win back now. We'll see if he can try to improve this position. Officially, Glosner is two for two in the takedown department and had his moments in that opening round looking for the fight finishing submission. Right now, Glosner's in a position he could pass this half guard. It is wide open. There is nothing really stopping it. Now he's trying to go towards a lockdown to keep him there. Nice shoulder pressure by Jeffrey Glosner. He's just using his one arm with his shoulder to control the head position of Ruiz. That's going to keep him on his back. Glosner told us that his power, his wrestling, and his jujitsu would be his biggest advantages in this fight. And here we are with 220 left in the second submission. He went out on a limb and said he would finish this fight via third round submission. Well, that's why he hasn't finished yet. He wants to be, he wants to be right. He wants to be like Mystic Mac as Sebastian Ruiz trying to fight off the attack of Glosner. What, what does Sebastian, well, I mean, Glosner all over. Ruiz is 
controlling that locking arm that's going to keep him in the fight, but it can still get tight, even with one arm. Glosner looking for his first submission win, looking to hand Ruiz his second defeat via submission, and Ruiz caught in that rear naked choke attempt, although beginning trying to alleviate the pressure, but going palm to palm, that's going to give him some strength there. Now that he's going face down, that's not a good thing for Ruiz. He's trying to build his base up, but he's got to protect his neck while doing that. He's okay right now. A minute 15 left in the second. Ruiz not panicking, trying desperately to escape him. Nice and forces Ruiz. Glosner to break the grip momentarily. Glosner looking to stuff Ruiz. Ruiz looking to gain some dominant position. Glosner was looking for a switch there. He was not in position to get it. That was a nice knee strike by Ruiz to the body. Ruiz rocking Glosner with the knee. Under a minute left in the second. Again, double unders right now. Glosner's corner Glosner. calling for the outside trip. Where is that with the double unders? He has control. Now he's lost the double unders, but he had control of the body, and that's when you can take him and push him one side or the other, using your leg to stop his leg. Glosner's taking Ruiz down twice. Dropping levels. He does not have his hands together, though. That's not an easy thing to do for that position. And now it's Ruiz looking for a guillotine choke. Yeah, he's not in trouble right now with this one. And time will become Ruiz's biggest enemy next to positioning. Glosner is sitting there too much. He's trying to relax, but don't let the position get to the point where now his weight's on top of you. So after a spirited second round, how do you have it on that unofficial scorecard of yours? And did you spill coffee on that unofficial scorecard? <laughs> yeah. I did not spill coffee because I don't have any coffee. I need coffee. Okay. What, you know, right now I have uh, Jeffrey Glosner is winning this fight. But Sebastian made a big change from the first round into the second round. And he's continue that type of... What was the big change? He was able to land good shots. He, he, got to position to watch this shot right here oh. that beautiful right hand that's a big change in the fight because when you all it takes is one one shot will change this no, fight when he's going after you see Glosner going down go, now, again go, Sebastian go, overextending go, went in too far go, 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 got in a bad go, position go, go, but eventually go, 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 worked his way out The bell in round three, Jeffrey Glosner in the red gloves out of the southpaw stand, Sebastian Ruiz in the blue gloves. Last time they took an L tonight, they're looking to bounce back. Who will win their first fight in Bellator MMA? There's a left hand delivered behind the guard by Glosner. Nice deep front kick to the body by Ruiz. And Ruiz talked about his kicks being a factor, but when you are taken down twice in three attempts, you want to uh, rethink about delivering kicks, right, John? Yeah, absolutely. You, you can bring him up high, but Glosner is very good at seeing that kick when it's coming down low. He's good at taking his hand up close to it. Level change, but instead it's Glosner snatching the neck of Ruiz. He needs to control that leg. If he can control that leg, that's tight. Nice job of coming up on top. Got a good chance of making this work, but he needs to feel exactly what Sebastian is doing. He'll know if he's got this choke or not. I do not think it's going to work. He's right now just needs to control the position, settle himself down, get back to doing what he was doing before with his grounded pound. Glosner's corner calling for the knee on belly position to keep him where he's at. Right you agree, John? No, I don't. Not, not, not right now with his feet on the fence. You put your knee on the belly. It's going to be he's going to use that fence to buck you off because you have a lot of weight that's up off of him. It makes it easy for him to get that weight moving towards the center of this cage.
right now, you see that hand still in place, but that choke is not, he's not even squeezing on it right now, but he's trying to hold it where he thinks he can get the position and make the deal work. Do you hear that beautiful music to our ears? A convivial atmosphere here at Mohegan Sun Arena. They've broken out into song right. as we watch Jeffrey Gloucester look to put the finishing touches on a submission. He's switching it into a Dars choke right now. on belly right now that's what he's going with still has his arms locked in that dart so what he needs to do is just start to center his weight down on top and just continue to put pressure with it and it was a darts choke that led to Ruiz's first loss and first loss via submission notice how high his hips are well take a look at where he's at he wants to settle his weight down on his opponent he's he's bringing his weight up which is making the choke not as strong and Glasgow putting a lot of pressure on, doesn't want to tire out his arms in search of this Darce choke. This is what will happen right now. He's holding on to it. He has that position, but he needs to settle his weight down on top of his opponent. And he's right in front of us. starting to take that, starting to push that, hips down. And he was looking directly into your eyes there for a moment, BJ. And this Glasgow's looking for the submission. I almost didn't want to coach him. Like, I don't want to say it. He predicted a third round. Submission is Jeffrey Glosner's vision going to come to fruition or is Sebastian Ruiz going to survive Ruiz back to his feet? Nice job by Sebastian Ruiz to remain calm, get himself back to his feet. It's a nice high crotch position for Jeffrey Glosner. We'll see if he can take it back down to the canvas. Elbows right there by Sebastian broke that grip. Jeffrey Glosner's 25, Sebastian Ruiz 23, both of them very much in the embryonic stages of their professional mixed martial arts journeys. Jeffrey Glosner back to having double unders. He's got a good body lock. He can take him either way, depending upon what he feels as far as the positioning of Sebastian Ruiz's balance and weight. Final 45 seconds of the fight. The level change by Glosner looking for one final takedown. He's two for three, while Ruiz is 0 for three in the takedown attempts. And now Ruiz catching the next, but the big takedown by Glosner. Big takedown by Glosner, and right now he's in a position with where that arm is at. He can go into a bomb flu choke, but he needs to free up that left arm. Frees his left arm, gets his right arm underneath the head and neck of Sebastian Ruiz. He'll be able to control it. Now he popped his head out. Well, Jeffrey Glasner's prediction may not come true, even though he is again going for a submission. A fine performance for Jeffrey Glasner. Absolutely. And for Sebastian Ruiz, again, there are losses in life, but if they are teaching moments, if they are learning experiences, then they will benefit you down the road. And by the way, he's only 23 years of age. Absolutely. When we, when we talk about this, obviously he wants to win the fight. But you either win or you learn. And there's a lot to learn from this fight when he goes back and watches it. And there's a lot of things that he did that were really good. And one of the things he did is he relaxed inside of the cage. He did not let positions bother him, and he kept fighting. That was a very nice job by Sebastian Ruiz. And of course, there are people out there who are going, wait a minute, you told us he's two and three at 23. Could have very well just lost his third consecutive fight. What do you mean he still has a future? Well, mixed martial arts, unlike my other favorite sport, boxing, losses happen, and losses do not penalize the fighter. It is a part of their career, a part of the journey. And I remember Mirko Krokop, the decorated striker from Croatian Pride, once saying, if you have not lost, you have not fought anybody. Exactly, and that's that's really what you're looking at is right now, obviously, Sebastian Ruiz is not, not happy that he knows he's not going to get the win, but he did a lot of good things in there. Are there things for him to improve on? Of course, and that could be the difference in him getting the win next time. Meanwhile, for Jeffrey Glosner, who went after submission, after submission, was 0 for 6, but came close to picking up his first submission victory. We await the, the judges' scorecards. Again, the...
the differences of fighting in a cage, and you saw the body positioning of Glosner with Ruiz. A lot of times, that cage is going to change the ability of that submission to work based upon you being able to elevate your body above the canvas. That's what Ruiz did. Here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we go to your three judges. Your first judge, David Hagan, scores it 30 to 27, while judges Dave Peabody, Mike Murtha, both see it the same, 29, 28. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Jeffrey Gloucester. Jeffrey Glosner picks up his first win in Bellator MMA, improving his record in the promotion to one and one. He is now three and two overall with a decision victory over Sebastian Ruiz, who is now two and four and 0 oh and two in the Bellator MMA cage. Let's go to Jed Brown. Well, thanks, Mark. Tonight we have a fantastic bantamweight matchup between the third-ranked Magomed Magomedov and fourth-ranked Rafion Stotts. Now, both fighters are treating tonight as a number one contender fight with hopes to face the champion, Sergio Pettis. So lots on the line heading into this one. I know uh, both guys up here at the desk with me, Josh and Austin, are super excited for this matchup. So let's start with Magomed first. Uh, Austin, what is it about that Dagestani style of Sambo wrestling that makes him so dangerous? Well, it's their understanding of positioning and how to be heavy but also when they get their hands locked as we've seen with Magomed before you're probably going for a ride. Uh, when we talked to Rafi on Stotts this week Josh he, he said I'm comfortable fighting wrestlers he says I understand that uh, style of fighting right he says I'm, I don't mind going to the ground with him I'm curious do you think uh, given his you know speed and reach advantage on the feet should he be looking to keep this fight on the feet? Absolutely but Oh, everyone says they're okay with wrestling at Dagestani until they have to actually wrestle them. And they realize, like Austin said, it's too difficult. So look, absolutely he's got to keep on the feet. He's got a little bit of a reach advantage. He's got the speed advantage. And I think to obviously on the feet is where his advantages all lie. Why get into that mix up on the wrestling? Well, you don't have to. Well, both fighters are coming in uh, with a, a very impressive win streak. Uh, Rafian Stotts has eight uh, straight wins. Uh, five for Magomed Magomedov. I know you kind of said this could be fight of, fight of the night. Why should fans be excited about this one? I think we're going to just see a lot of exciting scrambles. Uh, they're both great grapplers. I think Rafion, it'd behoove him to use his wrestling to keep the fight standing and use that explosiveness to maybe get a knockout. This will be the most technical fight tonight in that cage. And I cannot wait to watch it happen because, like he said, two ferrets grappling around on the ground. We're going to see that. We're going to see some explosive work on the feet done by Rafion Stotts as well. All right, looking forward to that one. All right, uh, that's coming up later on Showtime. Now let's head back down cage sides for more uh, final fight uh, for our prelims here tomorrow. All right, Jen, thank you very much. Former Invicta featherweight champion Pam Sorensen making her Bellator MMA debut against Roberta Samad, who is also fighting under the Bellator MMA banner for the first time. Let's go to the tail of the tape for our final preliminary bout. Right now, look, take a look at that reach, 63.5 compared to 68. That's a big advantage for Roberta. With the official introductions, here's Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Mohegan Sun Arena from the Bellator 264 prelims will go to the featherweight division set for three five-minute rounds introducing oh, the blue you. corner. Thank you. At five foot eight, weighing in 146 pounds in her Bellator debut. She brings five professional victories, one defeat originally. No Brazil, she fights out of Columbus, Ohio, Roberta Crush. And across the cage, her adversary out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 145 and three quarter pounds as a professional. Eight wins, three losses, fighting out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Pam, Pam Sorensen. In charge, your referee Kevin McDonald. Kevin McDonald is the referee. Roberta Samad actually made her Bellator debut way back at Bellator 146, November of 2015, Ready losing five? via unanimous Ready decision to former Bellator featherweight champion Julia Budd. The bell, round one. It is Pam Bam Sorensen in the red gloves, Roberta Samad in the blue gloves. Overhand right by Sorensen to introduce herself to both Samad and the Bellator MMA audience.
deceptive start by Sorensen. Bam Bam Sorensen's got a real active wrestling background. She likes to get to fight the ground, but she's going against a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, someone that really likes being on the ground, so she might want to use her wrestling to keep this on the feet if she feels comfortable there. It's clear coming to Bellator hoping to one day face off with Chris Cyborg, the current featherweight queen here in Bellator MMA. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> There's a counter right hand by Samad. Very nice right hand by Samad. That man did clean me. That's why you see Sorensen backing up right now. Samad putting her punches together. Sorensen off balance before picking her to the fence. Uh, body lock by Samad, smothering Sorensen against the cage. Knee to the belly by Samad. Nice job. Samad working out with Matt Brown, a guy who you talked about being very aggressive in the clinch. Big elbows, big knees. If she learned anything from him, she's going to be dangerous there. Not a fan of fighting if you're not a fan of the immortal Matt Brown. Low. Two minutes gone here in the first round. Right now, very good clinch game by Samad. That was some nice news. You see her using the shoulder strike. She's just using a dirty boxing type of game, even though it's not punches. She's using the clinch to land strikes that's just going to degrade what Pam Sorensen is able to do later on in the fight. Midway point of the opening round, and Sorensen has her back stapled to the fence by Roberta Samad, the 33 year old who. Is five and one overall as a mixed martial artist before separation is created. Samad coming forward. Sorensen with notable victories over Caitlin Young, Jessica Rose Clark, and Nico Montano. Sorensen has had, had a very good career. A lot of her fights in Invicta. She's just that grinding style. She never stops. She keeps on coming forward. There's Samad attacks her with a left hand. Both of them are coming up. Victories again. Sorensen in her first Bellator MMA fight while Samad returns after nearly six years away from the Bellator MMA cage. A minute and a half here left in the first round. Take a look at those strike stats right now. Samad 16 of 30, 12 of 52 for Sorensen. So Sorensen trying to be more active, but she's just not being near as active. Sorensen gets dropped. Sorensen coming forward with the jab, but not having much of an effect on Samad, who continues to march forward. Samad needs to really take a look at when Sorensen throwing that kick right there. She keeps backing up. That kick has no power, and she should take advantage of it and land a counter strike. That left hook coming in is going to do a lot of damage if she can time it right. It was in 2015 when Roberta Samad made her Bellator MMA debut. The first, the same year that Sorensen started her pro MMA career. Sorensen, eight and three with one knockout and one armbar submission on her resume. Samad, five and one with three knockouts and one RNC as they jockey for position along the cage. Samad with double underhooks right now. She's got double unders. That's a very good position for her to now use those knee strikes or if she feels Sorensen's body weight going in the direction. She can bring him down to the canvas. Knee to the head from the front headlock by Sorensen. Elbow strike across the jawline as we go to round two. How did you uh, adjudicate that opening round, Mr. Unofficial Score? Unofficially, I have Roberta Samad. 
winning that round. She landed the cleaner shots. There was the heavier shots overall. You gotta get it more. You're so, making, you're taller. Right now I have her ahead. Right? You're faster, you gotta get that jab working. I need rhythmic motion and jab, and I need footwork, rhythmic motion and jab. Okay. We work on that. Come over this warmed up with. We do it in the gym every day, yeah. right? Yeah. Give me a ring. You're gonna throw more jabs this round. You're waiting. You lost that round. You know that? Yeah, know. Okay, you lost that round. We can't afford to do that another one. So I need Love you starting out with it. pushing off the back foot. Single and double jabs. Go at this fucking girl. Okay. Fucking go at her jab right hand right behind <laughs> it. Let her feel your shit. Okay? All right. Seconds out, please. Seconds out. Smart throwing. Right hand straight down the pipe. Sorensen returning with a left hook. And then Sorensen right near the end of the round. Big elbow strike. Lands, doesn't have a lot of power on it, but it landed clean. Good strike by Pam Sorensen. Round two of our final preliminary bout. Bellator MMA on Showtime coming up at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Gegard Mousasi defending the Bellator middleweight championship against the number one contender, John Salter. In the main event, we begin round two here with Pam Sorensen in the red gloves. Roberta Samad with that spinning back fist that grazed across the top of Sorensen's nose. Nice right hand counter by Pam Sorensen. Spot just needs to really start getting off. She's starting to throw that jab, but then she stops. Got to commit to it. Sorensen's thrown more punches, but it is Samad who has landed more. Punch stats right now, 19 of 47 for Samad, 5 of 67 for Sorensen. Now you did hear Samad's corner tell her she lost that round. I like that from her corner because he doesn't know and he's saying it's a close oh, round. Nice shot. Sorensen looking to close the distance, connecting on the face of Roberta Samad. You're always better off telling your fighter, I think you lost that round, to make them go out and realize, hey, I got a fight. Oh, and Sorensen with the right hand has some swelling along the bottom of the left eye of Samad. And there's a stiff jab by Sorensen, splits Samad's guard. Two minutes gone here in the second, Sorensen coming forward, but there's the counter jab by Samad. Samad really needs to start taking advantage of that reach advantage that she gets. You know, she's sitting there, she's letting Sorensen control the range. Don't let her control it. You take over. You're the one that has that longer reach. Yeah, four and a half reach advantage for Roberta Samad as we near the midway point of the round and the fight. Go more. Go, go, go. Overhand low. Overhand low. Sorensen across the, the cheek of Samad, who switches momentarily to southpaw before going back to orthodox. Right now, it's just the activity of Sorensen. She's throwing more, and she's starting to land more because Samad is just not giving her a lot that's coming in her direction as far as offense. Sorensen has thrown a total of, well, over 100 punches, starting to show an uptick in her efficiency. Starting to definitely land more here in the second round on Samad. Samad has had enough of the striking of swords and would like to take it to the ground. Swords is good enough in the clinch. She keeps on framing, out, which is pushing ahead of Samad back. That's causing her problems and being able to think about getting that takedown. Samad told us her ground game is her best overall fighting strength. She 
wants to implement a good mixture of different styles and wanting to utilize her size, her wrestling and her ground experience, having little opportunity to do so except for her size in this fight. Yeah, well, right now, you know, if you've got a great ground game, that's awesome. But if you can't get it to the ground, and she's being tagged in the stand-up by Sorensen here in the second. Yes, Pam Sorensen's doing a nice job, even with the shorter reach. She's stepping inside and landing the counters. And meanwhile, Samad keeping her at bay momentarily with the long jab, but Sorensen closes the distance and aggressively trying to create separation. Nice job by Sorensen to push on the hedge, trying to bring the knee up. Samad, I uh, should have brought her backside. She had a chance of getting her to the ground, wasn't able to do it. Nice job by Pam Sorensen to maintain her position up against the cage and not allow Samad to take down. Right now, looking at this, I think this is an even fight. I know that Samad's corner told her she lost the first round. I think she actually got it on the scorecards. And I think that Pam Sorensen started to take over this fight. I think right now, going to the third round, it's anyone's fight. So we'll dig deep for us. I want you to clear your head. This is the last round. I need some action out of you. Okay, your weight, when you use it, it's there. It's there. Quit waiting. Finish with the right hand. Okay? When you get her against the cage, too, and you press her, you gotta stay low, keep your knees bent. She got. Pamps. This was the spinning back fist. It actually connected against the cheekbone just a little bit at the Seconds end of the glove out, there. Seconds out. Sorensen coming after her. Left Let's hand go. touches nicely. Pam Soren has done a good job of controlling the distance of this fight, not allowing the range of Samad to take over. We'll see who takes the third round. Final round underway between Pam Bam Sorensen, the former Invicta featherweight champion, in her M Bellator MMA debut against Roberta Samad, returning to Bellator after nearly a half dozen years in search of her first victory in the Bellator MMA cage. And Sorensen more active, but Samad able to pick her off with strikes coming forward. Samad coming out with a jab, landed a couple of jabs, then a right cross. She needs to just sit down and commit. She's popping that jab out there. Take her head off of the center line when she's throwing it. And then stay right on that center line. That's allowing Pam Sorensen to counter her and make her strike land. It's allowing Pam Sorensen to mark up some some out spaces. Some out looking for another spinning attack. See how that jab of Pam Sorensen is starting to really puff out the right eye of Roberta Sabat. Go, Bertie, go. Yes, go. Nice go left hand by Sabat. Again, where she just you saw her back up there. There was no reason to back up. She needs to step to the side and throw a count. Especially here in the third round with three and a half minutes left. It's time to put the uh, pedal to the metal, up taking offense, try to score the effective blow. And she talked about having the advantage in the wrestling and ground game. Well, has not even been able to secure a takedown. 0 oh, for 4 in the takedown department for Samad. Well, you got to give Pam Sorensen credit. She's got a good wrestling defense. And she's got a good striking game here in the third round, although she got countered effectively by Samad's jab. But it's going to take more than pot shotting. It's going to take more than single shots, John. Yeah, it does. You know, it's going to be multiples. It's going to have the effect on either one of them here. Pam Sorensen, she's landing cleaner shots as far as your straight. Go, 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 go. As you mentioned earlier, Samad continues to keep her head on the center line. And really unable to take advantage of that reach. Right now is about 50 of uh, 125 now, 28 of 160. 
71 for Sorensen. Now Samad finally gets this fight where she said she wanted it. Let's see what she can do from this position now. A black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a brown belt in Luta Libre, which Nogi. Under two minutes left in the final round, and she does have one submission win, a rear naked choke that came in her second fight back in June of 2013. For Sorensen, she has been submitted via rear naked choke that came against Felicia Spencer back in November of 2018. Felicia Spencer has a very good ground game, so that can definitely happen. Right now, you see Sorensen utilizing the guard, trying to control the posture of Samad. Samad needs to control those biceps and start to break past this guard. There you go when she's starting to posture up. Sorensen going to a high guard. Elbows from the bottom. Under a minute left in the fight. Let's go. Right now, although you're seeing Samad being in the top position. Where's the sense of urgency? Exactly. That's the whole thing. She's got to get this going. You got to figure, I need to win this round to possibly win this fight. Meanwhile, Sorensen continuing with that high guard, delivering some irritating strikes from the bottom, controlling the wrists of Samad. Spotted it now in a place where she can control her position. She tries to slice yep. inside. Now she control by inside. Samad. But only 22 seconds left. She needs to really open up. Sorensen active from her back, active hips, but Samad looking to go to mount. Being defended by Sorensen and. Our final preliminary bout of the night is headed to the judges' scorecards. It's going to be a question. We'll see which way the judges go on this one. This is one that I, I would probably bet. We're going to see what they call a split decision. So Pam Bam Sorensen in her Bellator MMA debut. What, what impressed you the most about her overall? game plan in this fight. You know what I li really liked about Pam Sorensen is she was the one controlling the range even though she is not the bigger fighter. And you saw that Roberta Sabat was able at times to utilize that jet but then she would stop and she definitely needs to start practicing getting that head off the center line because she's getting countered when she should not be getting countered. Bellator MMA looking to add depth to the featherweight division, looking to add some meat to the division in hopes of, uh, again, we have Katz and Gano, of course, knocking on the door of a title opportunity, and now Pam Bam Sorensen and Roberta Samad would have loved to have put their, their names in the proverbial hat, but based on tonight's performance, John, not ready for prime time. Definitely not ready for prime time, not with those performances. You gotta go out there and you gotta, you gotta be impressive. You got to go out there and say and make someone like the president Scott Coker go. Oh, I want to see you again. You talked about a split decision, and with the time ticking away, usually that means you're probably right, sir. Well, let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Dave Torelli, scores it 29-28. He sees it for Samad. Your second judge, John English, 29-28 for Sorensen. Your third and final judge, Jacob Montalvo, scores it 29-28 to for the winner by split decision, Pam Bam Sorensen. Just as Big John McCarthy said, a split decision. Former Invicta featherweight champion wins her Bellator MMA debut. Pam Bam Sorensen moving to nine and a three. Coming up at the top of the hour, live on Showtime, it is Bellator MMA, the main event. Gay Guard Musasi begins the second reign as Bellator middleweight champion, defending the title against number one contender, John Salter. Bellator MMA on Showtime, live at 9, 6 Pacific. The Bellator middleweight champion.
championship. The dream catcher, Gegard Mousasi, has cemented his storied legacy. Now, the legendary reigning middleweight champ defends his title in a five-round MMA battle. Mousasi, round and pound! When he faces suffocating submission specialist, John Salter, who's won eight of his last nine bouts in the Bellator arena. Bellator MMA, live tonight on Showtime, where warriors... The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division. And stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all of the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the Apple Store and Google Play. Not playing guard with Kendall Grove. Not a whole lot you can do when somebody's yeah. inside control like that. Exactly. And immediately Salter takes the back of Kendall Grove. And this is a guy who, in between fights, took the U.S. Abu Dhabi trials, most prestigious no gi grappling tournament in the world. He's an American rep. That was in between fights. That's how good he is, going hard for the rear naked. That's impressive. Can't see how deep it is from here. Kendall's not in a good spot there, though. That's for certain. He is not. Now both hooks in. Right he's right there, right there. Right there. And he's and it's over. Is that John Salter wins his sixth straight and records his tenth of victory oh, via first round knockout or submission. Oh, okay. And look at this transition. One hook in, and I'll let Meathead take the finish. You know, it was absolutely beautiful. It's a great setup. He was patient. He didn't rush anything. He just wanted to get his hands on him, go ahead and touch him. That's all he needed. Soon as he looked, he got on Kendall's hip. Everything was over from that point on. Great point, Jimmy, on Herb Dean, because he's very content in the work of John Salter. He knows what's going on. He does. Salter right now all over Dustin Jacoby. Once again, both hooks in. Rear naked, he's got that it. That is tight. That's under the chin. Herb Dean taking a really close.